Golang talk. Um, we're, we have some go, uh, some wise liners here. We also have some people from our network. Uh, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Bryn Hill. I'm the director of engineering at WiseLine in Vietnam, APAC. Uh, for those who haven't heard about WiseLine and WiseLine Academy before, I'll just do a quick intro. WiseLine is a software development and design services company. We have operations in the USA, Mexico, Vietnam, Thailand, Australia, and Spain. And uh, we are have about six years of experience and we're already up to over a thousand employees. We're very fast growing. We try to help other really high growth companies to build better products faster. Uh, we have different disciplines, technical writing, UX, project management, and of course, everything with engineering. So um, pretty much every language, uh, site reliability, engineering, cloud services, and so on. So uh, we work with really big brands like National Geographic, Shape Security, and Washington Post, and we continue to expand our footprint with uh, new clients and the new uh, verticals. So one of the things about our culture is we really want to empower our employees and our communities to innovate and grow. Uh, we want to provide uh, lots of options for, for learning and growth, uh, not only just inside of the company, but outside. And so as part of that, we created WiseLine Academy. And WiseLine Academy is a platform that we offer free educational programs, workshops, talks like this, and certifications in different technology skills. So if you follow us online, you'll see these posted. Obviously, you found this one, so you know what to do. Um, but obviously, uh, keep in touch, and we'll keep having these. So anyway, I'd like to go ahead and introduce our uh, speakers. So um, if you'd like to go ahead and kick it off, uh, Ivan and Andrea. Hello, everyone. Nice to meet you. My name is Andrea. Um, I work for WiseLine as a site reliability engineer. Uh, let me share my screen to, so you can see my slide. Uh, this is me. Uh, I am an open source software contributor, mainly to Linux, the Linux kernel and to the Arch Linux distribution. I have also made contributions to Go and Go related projects. I'm interested in cryptography, mathematics, I love coffee and I have three dogs. Now, uh, thanks, Brent. I think you can continue now. Um. Hey, hello. Um, so from the side, my name is Pangalavis. I will be talking after Andrea, so I will be presenting later. <laughs> Okay, so <clears throat> I think we can get started. Yep. Are we waiting on anyone else? No. Uh, okay. Unless, uh, Eric, are you going to give a talk to? Um, no, I'm just here listening. Or thank you for asking. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, Gok, uh, are you going to give a talk to? You want to present yourself? Okay, uh, then let's continue. I think you can start, Andrea, yes. <clears throat> so first of all, I would like to share with you some important notes, like please see the identify yourself in Zoom using your name and your last name. Please also mute your microphone during the course so it doesn't interrupt other participants. And you can use the chat for questions during the question and answer sections that are going to be done after each, of, after each one of the talks. Please also focus your questions on the presented topic and turn off your camera in case you have connection issues. <clears throat> we have also a, a, an academic code of conduct, which includes being respectful. There are no bad questions or ideas, so feel free to ask. We are here to help you. And please be, also be welcoming and patient with other participants and their, their questions. Another thing is to be careful in the words that you choose. So, they, they don't hurt other people. Now, let's talk about the agenda and the topics we are going to cover today. The first one is heap and stack. Then why, a garbage, why do we need a garbage collector? We are going to visualize different garbage collector algorithms. And we are also going to talk about the collector behavior as well as a question and answer section. Oops. 
first of all, let's talk about the stack and the heap. Um, I would like you to take away the notions that you may have already about the stack and the heap regarding data structures and algorithms, because we are going to focus about stack and heap in memory. So first of all, um, the stack is used for static memory allocation. And like its name says, it's a, it's a, a stack that is of last in, first out. Uh, you can think of it as a pile of boxes. And it has some advantages, like it's pretty fast due to the, its static nature. And retrieving data from it is also pretty, pretty fast because, because the information is only stored and they are retrieved from the upper uppermost block of the stack. So getting information is something pretty fast. You just need to go to the top stack and retrieve that memory address. Uh, however, this means that any data that is stored in the stack must be finite and static. <clears throat> what does this mean? This means that you must know the, the size of the, the data that you're, you're going to store in compilation time. So this can be troubleshooting. This can be problematic if you want to store dynamic uh, informa information with dynamic sizes because you can't store it here. Now, it's also important to note here that <clears throat> uh, at least in Go, all, all the data of execution frames is stored in a stack frame. What does this mean? This means that any function that you declare in Go has its own stack. And that stack belongs only to that function. And you can't share that stack between functions to other functions. If you would like to do that, you would need to use dynamic memory, which is the heap. Now, each stack frame is a reserved block in memory address where you are storing the data. Um, for example, <clears throat> each time a, fun a function declares a new variable, this variable is pushed to the uppermost block <clears throat> of the stack. And then each time a function exits, the, the, this stack is cleaned. Like you, you are not going to need it because that function returned a value or it simply terminated its execution for whatever reason you can imagine. And this stack is clean, okay? And it's one thing that is also important to note is that multi-threaded applications have a stack per thread. <clears throat> and as you can see in this illustration, we have two very cute golfers who are arranging a pile of boxes. And they are working pretty hard to arrange them in a stack, like we have here. And more or less, this is how our stack looks in memory. <clears throat> One thing that is important to note is that memory management in the stack is done by the operating system of your, cho of your choosing. And it's something pretty good because you can let the operating system manage the memory the way it wants, which is pretty helpful for programmers and for creating a programming language. You don't have to worry about those abstractions anymore. <clears throat> unless you are the one creating the operating system. And data in this stack is, are usually uh, variables uh, like primitives, like integers or pointing to other function frames, things like that. So that's what you usually store here. And another thing that is important for you to know is that the stack overflow happens here, like the name says it's an stack overflow. So in case you encounter an stack overflow error during during execution, you're going to find or compilation, you're going to find it here. And lastly, there's a there's a size that most values that most programming languages has for the stack. However, this <coughs> this also has a, <coughs> this also has a lot of things to do with the your operating system, the version of the programming language that you're using. So it's pretty hard for me to keep you an estimate of the limit that goes size for this. So I would leave it up to you to the to the version that you're using in your operating system to determine the limit. Now let's continue with the heap. <clears throat> Since we have a stack for um, static memory allocation, 
we need some place to store dynamic memory allocations, right? And we have it. We have the heap, which unlike the stack, the programming needs to look up the data in heap using pointers. And the key difference here is that the heap is created and populated during execution. Meanwhile, the stack is created and, and populated with data during compilation. And the heap is slower than the stack <clears throat> because the process of searching for data is more complicated, but it can also store more, more data. You can, <clears throat> you can think of the, of the heap like a big library where if you go to a library, you can have a, an index of books. For example, if you want to search for a specific books of a specific outdoor or, a, of a, or, a, or of a specific gender, you can simply go to the index and, and look for, a, for a, book, a specific book. And more or less is the heap works like that. The programming language has, during your program during ex execution has like an index of memory, memory addresses where it can find relevant information to it. So it's more or less like a li library. And another thing that is important to know here is that data in the heap can have a dynamic size. <clears throat> this means that you can have data that in runtime is changing its size. For example, uh, a structure or, or a slice, ingo, uh, things like that that are dynamic in nature. Other thing to note here is that the heap is shared among threads. Unlike this stack, because if you recall correctly from, from this slide, the stack is the, the stack is not shared in multi-threaded applications because each thread has a stack. But in the heap, it is shared. All your threads have a, have a heap. So this is pretty useful to know if you're writing a multi-threaded application. And lastly, that the data that is typically stored here are global variables, uh, reference to objects, uh, strings, maps, and other, and other complex structures. Now, it has some disadvantages because due to its dynamic nature, it's way more complicated to manage. And here is where the, most of the problems with memory management happen. And that's why we usually implement memory management techniques like garbage collection in many programming languages or um, borrow checking in languages like Rust, which is also a pretty interesting approach to memory management. And it can help programmers quite a lot to save time. Uh, another thing to note here is that out of memory errors happen in the heap but never in the stack. They, they always happen here. So if you encounter one of these errors during your programming, your, during your program execution, you can find it here. And theoretically, there's no limit to the amount of data that you can store in the heap. But please emphasize theoretically because there's a physical limit to it. And that's the size of your RAM memory. So let's continue. Uh, you may be wondering right now, like, how do I know whether a variable is allocated in the heap or the stack? And that's a pretty good question. However, we are using Go. And with Go, you don't need to know. Why do, why do you don't need to know? I mean, if I don't need to know that, then why do we have this talk, right? Um, you don't need to know because the storage location is chosen by the implementation uh, and that is irrelevant to the semantics of the language. I mean, if you're using Go the right way, then the compiler and the runtime are going to allocate memory the, the right way. So I would suggest for you to focus on understanding Go, um, how Go works, how to use Go correctly and believe me, the compiler and the Go and Go's runtime will help you with that. Um, another thing to take into account is that this storage location does have an effect on writing efficient programs. However, writing efficient Go code 
is the key to writing efficient Go programs. So focus on that. Focus on the semantics of the language, on learning the language correctly, and that will that will provide you with the right memory allocations. Another thing to note is that it is possible that, well, when possible, Go compilers will allocate variables that are local to a function in that function stack frame. But there can be cases where the compiler can't know if that variable is local to the function stack frame, or if it's going to be referenced in another function, or if it should be like, or, or if it has a pointer to some other place, and it will probably store it in the, in the heap. Like the Go compiler does this to prevent the stack overflow errors when it can't be completely sure that that variable is only used in that stack frame. So writing efficient Go programs uh, would help you to avoid this problem because the compiler will understand will understand that 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 variable is local to that function. Okay. Now another thing to take into account is that. Um, the the heap is the place where you are you are having the garbage collection, because why? Because the stack is is managed by the operating system. So if the compiler can't know where where to store that function, it will throw it to the heap, and in the heap it will be controlled by the garbage collection garbage collector. <clears throat> I want to show you here an example. This is a pretty simple code in C that I wrote to illustrate a dangling pointer. Um, as you can see, we have a variable X, which is a local variable and, go, and goes out of the scope after an execution of this function. Once this function is over, this variable no longer has a stack frame. And in this case, the variable pointer is pointing to something that was already clean. Remember that I am cleaning my, my memory here. So I no longer have a reference to this variable. So this will would print something random in this case, probably a zero or probably something that is stored in that memory address. And now we have the a variable X that has a scope throughout the program. And we don't have a dangling pointer in here because it points to a static variable that is stored in the heap. You may be wondering, hey, Andrea, if the meetup is about Go, why did, are you giving an example in C? And that's a pretty good question. The reason why the example is in C is because illustrating these kind of problems is pretty hard in Go, because the compiler and the runtime help you to prevent these kind of mistakes from happening. That's why I had to use a, a programming language where I manage memory manually instead of a language that where I have a garbage collector. Because in Go, if this happens, the variable X would be stored, would, be go, would, would go directly to the heap and it would be garbage collected. However, I want it to, to be in the stack. I can only do that with C or C++ programming languages where I manage memory manually. <clears throat> okay, so one question here is, why do we need a garbage collector? Why, why do we use garbage collection? Well, <clears throat> we use it because manual memory management consumes a significant amount of, of programming, programmer's time, and it's often the cause of pernicious bugs. In languages like C, in which the memory management is done manually, this tends to consume a lot of programming's time a lot of programmers time and tends to be the cause of very pernicious bugs. Even in languages like C++ or ROS that can easily implement mechanisms for automatic memory management, these mechanisms can have a very high impact in, in the design of efficient programs because a programmer would need to understand the semantics of something like the borrow checker to implement memory management correctly. I have seen pretty good programmers having a very hard time understanding what the borrow checker does in Rust. And garbage collection is a more uh, is a more intuitive approach to memory management, and it's also easier to understand. Another thing to take into account is that when when Robert Pike and 
Ken, Ken Thompson and, and Robert Griesmeyer were creating Go, they designed a language that had a, a very efficient garbage collection that could optimize programmers' time and that can be pretty fast during execution. Because if you have worked with other programming languages, for example, like Java, you can see that a lot of people complain about Java's garbage collector because I, I, I am uh, because it can be like sometimes slow, sometimes it consumes a lot of memory resources. For example, it's it's a well-known fact that Java programs tend to consume a lot of RAM memory, and that doesn't happen in Go. So don't be afraid like, about this garbage collector because this garbage collector implements one of the most efficient techniques out there. And it's also pretty cheap. This means that it has a pretty low latency to be feasible to use in network systems, which is one of the key points to use Go. Another thing is that uh, oh, well, let me show you something. Uh, for example, we are talking about pernicious box. If we go to, to the site of, of Mitri, we can see that we have a lot of CVs that are used after free. Use after free is exactly the problem I showed you of dangling pointers. And as you can see, we have 3000 vulnerabilities uh, that are that are that are the cause of a use after free problem. The most recent one is in Mac OS and WatchOS, Safari. Uh, as you can see, iOS also has this bug, and these are pretty recent bugs. I, I think this one was released yesterday, something like that. But there are three thousand, and believe me, some of the best programmers in the world in the world work at Apple and they are having a hard time managing memory as you can see here because it causes bugs. And you can also find a lot of bugs like this in Google Chrome um, from programmers that work in Google. Here's one from, from Huawei. And well, there's a lot of them. That's why memory automatic memory management can be helpful. So you don't have the use of the free box. <clears throat> now let's continue. As you may already know, Go is a programming language that is essential when you want to write concurrency, concurrency related programs. For example, uh, Elixir and Erlang are also pretty good at concurrency and Go is one of the, the, the main languages for that. <clears throat> and one of the most complicated things, well, concurrency, con concurrency it's a pretty hard topic in itself. And one of the most complicated things of, of writing concurrent programs has its roots in the object lifetime problem. Uh, but what does this mean? Well, the object lifetime problem um, means that when one object passes from one thread to another, it's pretty complicated to guarantee that the, the objects are freed on time. As, as a pretty small example here, we have a pretty cute gopher that is throwing a, a life vest to memory addresses that are in the ocean. So imagine that you're writing a multi-threaded application and, and, you, and the ocean is your, are your threads and you are throwing bags of memory addresses there. It would be pretty hard to, to know where all your memory addresses are because well, the ocean is pretty big and can, be, can have a pretty erratic um, movement, so it can be pretty hard. Something similar happens with your threads. <clears throat> and automatic memory management makes the concurrent code to be more easy to write because you no longer have to worry about the implementation of memory management. You just, use, you just make use of the garbage collector and that's pretty helpful for you. And implementing a garbage collector that can work with concurrency it's pretty hard, like it's something pretty hard to implement. The good thing is that you don't have to worry about it because the Go development team has already done that for you. And lastly, uh, taking a, away um, simultaneity, 
the recollection of elements that are not used simplifies interfaces because you no longer need to specify how to manage memory in them. Remember that Go was created in Google as a replacement for most of the code they had in T++ because it was pretty problematic for them to have a very big team of people working in a C++ code base because C++ is hard to manage. And they created Go for that reason. However, Go has something called interfaces, which allow you to implement code from other programming languages pretty easily. Google needed that because they can't simply throw away all, all their C++ code base. They, they created Go so they can easily implement other, other code from other languages, for example, code from C++ into Go. So they can make use of their existing code bases and start migrating gradually to Go. <clears throat> now, this is something pretty interesting because we are going to visualize different garbage collection algorithms. Uh, give me one moment because the parts of the slide are not loading. Uh huh. Give me one second. I will show the slides. Um, One second, please. This is a, a an error in in Google Slides. Um, let me open it in, a, in another window. Uh, as you can see here, this one is the most simple technique, which is like uh, let, let me refresh it so it starts from the beginning. Sorry for these inconveniences. Google Slides. <clears throat> um, this is the, the the most simple approach that you can that you can have when managing memory manually, which is called cleanup, cleanup at the end, which is also known as having no garbage collector. This is the simplest way of cleaning up garbage uh, memory, which is uh, use your use your memory during programming during the program execution and then clean it one, once the task is done. Uh, once it, the task is done, you can dispose of everything. This is particularly useful if you have a way of breaking a, a task into very small pieces, but doing that realistically, it's pretty hard to do. Especially if you have multi-threaded applications, this approach won't work. If you have a concurrent application, this approach won't work. And as you can see here, um, it should have ended and cleaned everything. Well, as you can see here, this is an illustration of the memory. Like the, the, the black squares are free memory that you have. And the green squares are is, is your program um, using memory. And once it finishes using memory, it will start cleaning everything. Let's just visualize how it works. It, I think it's a pretty beautiful illustration. And the, the dots that are flashing is your programming doing something, whatever it needs to do. And looks like it finished it, its execution and it will start cleaning everything. And while it does that, let's continue with the next slide. Same thing. <clears throat> uh, the next al algorithm I would like to show you is the reference counting collector. Let me copy the link for the illustration. Uh -huh. Here it is. <clears throat> um, the reference counting collector is another pretty simple approach to, to manage memory. And it consists of basically counting 
how many times you're using a resource and dispose of it when the count drops to zero. As you can see, the, our programming is doing something and you can see that the black squares are turning black again. Why? Because it has a reference counting collector. This means that it sees that these memory addresses are no longer being referenced and it disposes of, of them. One thing that is important to know about this kind of garbage collector is that it easily integrates with other resource managers and existing code bases. Actually, the team at, at Apple from Objective-C decided to implement a garbage collector at some point. And they tried to implement a, a mark and sweep garbage collector, but they were unable to do so because it was breaking a lot of code bases of big code bases that were written in Objective-C. So they had to implement a reference counting collector. Uh, the problem with this garbage type of garbage collector is that it can handle cyclic references and it's also not pretty good at threaded for threaded applications or for concurrent programming. Um, the team at Objective-C well, well, had to implement this one because no other garbage collector is easy to implement with existing code bases if you don't implement it from the start. <clears throat> now, the mark and sweep is the garbage collector that Go uses. And let me show you the visualization of it. Uh -huh. Well, as you can see from the previous garbage collector, it uh, pretty much cleans up all of the memory, so it's pretty efficient. Now let's see the mark and sweep garbage collect. <coughs> this type of garbage collector is, is the one that Go implements and it's pretty efficient. Uh, as you can see, it cleans big chunks of memory at one time and can, can easily handle cyclic structures. It also has a lower, a lower overhead since it doesn't need to maintain counts like the reference count uh, collector that we saw previously. And it, 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 it requires uh, more implementation code and more implementation consistency than reference counting algorithms. It's also more difficult to retrofit this type of garbage collector into existing code bases due to the, the nature of of a harder implementation, but it has its perks. Like it's faster, it, it requires less overhead because you are not reference counting. You can handle cyclic structures. It's pretty good for concurrent programming and it's also pretty good for multi-threaded applications. So it's worth it, but you have to implement it at the beginning. Otherwise you can retrofit it with existing code bases. A pretty cool thing I like about Go is that Go is backward compatible to pretty much all of the versions it has. Like you can run a Go code from Go 0 0.7 and it, it most likely will run with a recent compiler. That's pretty cool. And you don't tend to see that too often with programming languages or even with software in general. So I think they are doing a pretty good job with Go. Now let, <clears throat> let's talk about collector behavior. Um, when a collection starts, uh, uh -huh. when a garbage collection starts, the collector goes to through three phases of work. The first one is the mark and setup, which is a stop the world. What I mean with the stop the world is that you can do anything other than mark and setup. Like you need to, to stop all tasks in order to perform these specific tasks. Okay. Then we go through a second uh, a second phase, which is marking. Marking is done concurrently. And lastly, we have mark termination, which is also stop the world. If you recall correctly, our garbage collector is mark, mark and sweep. So step one is mark, 
And step three is, is sweep. Once you mark everything, you, you can sweep it. And the purpose of uh, when, well, this is, <clears throat> this is interesting because when memory, when, when garbage collection starts, the first activity that the garbage collector needs to do is to activate the, the great barrier. Uh, this allows the garbage collector to maintain data integrity on the heap during a collection because both the collector and the application, the go routines of the application will be running concurrently. If you are not uh, careful here, you can create a, a race condition and you can clean memory where, when, when you shouldn't be cleaning it. Cleaning it. That's why the easiest approach to this is to stop the world. <laughs> stop doing whatever you're doing. I'm going to clean memory. And <clears throat> once you have stopped all the applications, you are going to face a, a, a pretty small overhead, which is around 10 and 30 microseconds. So it's negligible. To be real, to be realistic, it's something like you 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 probably don't care about it in most applications. And it's also worth it. I mean, the amount of programmers time that you're saving by using a garbage collector is worth 30 microseconds of latency in your application. And anytime the, the go routines are behaving correctly and they are implemented correctly, they can, you can have a very negligible overhead of 30 microseconds. And <clears throat> in this illustration, you can see that we have four go routines which we are going to call P1, P2, P3, P4. And we also have the memory addresses here and here we have the garbage collector. And as you can see, these core routines are in green. This means that they are running at the moment, but in order for the gar garbage collector to work, it must wait for each of these four core routines to stop. <clears throat> Uh, the only way to do it, to do to do this is to have the garbage collector observing the relationship between a go routine and the memory, so it can know when a go routine finished. And the calls to function guarantee that the go routines are in a safe spot to be stopped. But you may be wondering now, what would happen if one of these go routines doesn't make a function call? but the other ones do. Like what if one doesn't make it? Uh, well, we have this example here, which is a real problem. The garbage collector can complete once we have stopped the go routine that is in P4. As you can see, it's currently working and we can do that because we have a, we, we, we can have a, um, a race condition where we can clean the memory when we shouldn't. And we can that, can, that could cause a, an error in our program during runtime. And for example, we have a, an infinite loop in here. And imagine that uh, the go routine is doing, doing that operation. Like you, 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 you would need to stop that before you can clean up the memory. And that could affect these go routines. That's why, like we said at the beginning, if you are using Go correctly, you don't have to worry about these little things because most likely you won't be using uh, a Go routine that would be affecting other Go routines by adding an, an infinite loop to a specific Go routine. So using the language correctly would prevent these kind of problems to happen. And <clears throat> I, I think we can go to the questions because I, th I think we have seen a lot of information right now. So this is our feedback survey. And in case you have any questions, please leave them in the chat and I will take a look at them. And pl please answer our feedback survey because it helps us to improve. Another thing to note here is that if you would like us to give you courses about other topics, Kubernetes, uh, Rust, JavaScript, whatever, please let us know. And we can coordinate with Western Academy to prepare the courses for you. We are here to help you. Thank you.
Uh, I think I lost the Zoom chat. I don't know if there are questions. Oh, here's the chat. Um, I will I will wait just one more minute to see if anyone has a question. If not, my co-worker Ivan Galavis will continue talking about concurrency. Thanks, Alex. I'm, I'm glad you liked it. Okay, so it looks like we don't have any questions. So I would let my co-worker Ivan Galavis to continue with his presentation. Thank you very much for the funding. Thank you, Andrea. Thanks for the great presentation. Um, Thank you. Okay, so I will start sharing my slides. Just give me one minute. That's it. Um, okay, I'm assuming you can see my slides now. If not, l please let me know. I think it's okay. So yeah, uh, okay, thank you for coming. We are going to talk about concurrency patterns in Go. Um, for this, well, my name is Ivan Galavis and you can find me in GitHub and with this handler. Okay, so, well, this is my photo. And this is my name. I'm a software engineer and I have been working in Wiseline for the past two years. And I have been working with Go for like a year or so. What I'm passionate about is uh, writing green code, uh, sorry, clean code and sharing my findings with the community. Uh, so the agenda for today will be uh, a little a brief review on concurrency. Then we can jump into some Go spe specifics for Go. And then we can see some concurrency patterns. In general, this should be a pretty quick talk. So for the review on concurrency, what exactly is concurrency? Well, we can see it like processing uh, and securing independently, having to deal with a lot of things at once, but this is important. And I want to clarify that concurrency is not parallelism. The fact that we have concurrency doesn't mean that we necessarily have to have uh, have to have parallelism in our programs. Uh, this could be very heavy to process, so maybe we can take a look at this example with some gophers. For example, let's take a look at this sequential model. Uh, we have three jobs, but the, those three jobs are being made by the same process. In this case, the process is, uh, is pictured by, the, by a, a single gopher. This gopher is called Gary, and Gary has three jobs. Gary is a finder, a miner, and a smelter. And since Gary is just a common gopher, he cannot, he is an omnipresent, and he cannot be in three times, at, uh, in three places at the same time. So Gary has to find some ore first, then he has to mine the ore, then he has to smelt the ore. And well, this isn't optimal, right? If we, will, if we will want to transform this sequential model into a concurrent model, we'll need to add some gophers to the equation. In this case, we added Jane and Peter. Jane took the role of the miner, and Peter is the smelter. So given the case that Gary already found R, Jane could proceed with her job, and the same case with Peter. And so we looked at this uh, sequential model transform into a concurrent model by putting some more processes. Or uh, we could say that we put some uh, hands into the job to do things concurrently, but not necessarily parallel. I hope that make a little bit more sense. If not, don't worry, we're going to explore it a bit later on. Uh, about the specifics of Go into concurrency, we have some tools that we can use. For example, we have channels that are used to send and receive values. Uh, we can see like this, sorry, this thing over here is our channel and the Go routines. The Go routines are like, like I was uh, saying, we can say that each Go ferry over here is a process and we can see them as Go routines, which are not threads, but can be seen as a lightweight thread. 
We also have some atomic operations and the package sync. Why are they important? Because atomic operations cannot be interrupted, that's the, their design, and they are useful when you don't really need to use a channel. The package sync, in the, on the other hand, uh, is used for low-level low synchronization operations, and also because the weight group and the ones operations that are widely used when uh, programming concurrency in Go uh, are living that package. And we don't really need to know more about uh, Go specific sync concurrency, and, and guess what? We can jump straight into, into Go right now. So, uh, just to clarify something, does all these examples are, are taken from this repo? Uh, all the examples that you see in this presentation. So go take a look if you want to see more examples similar to this. Uh, he, here we have some pretty easy examples. We have a main function and a simple function. What I want you to uh, see over here is that our single function receives a message and a channel. In this case, our simple function is uh, looping indefin indefinitely or like forever and we are just sending some value to the channel and sleeping for some uh, some milliseconds it's very simple right so uh, in this case we make a channel in the at the beginning of our main function then we use the reserve word go to launch uh, to launch a go routine um, of a function that we uh, that we select for this and we um, iterate five times over here and then we print a lib um, an exit message we can imagine this output right it's pretty simple we print this thing uh, five times and we print it print it with a message that we send over here and as simple as that we have concurrent go concurrent code in go so while concurrency isn't easy by any means it uh, go makes it simple and that's what that's why I really like this language. Okay, so we have another example over here. Um, I didn't mention it, but channels are native in Go and they are like low level structures. What does this mean? It means that channels, are, we can use them as return values in a function. This allows us to create uh, generators, for example, in this case. We create a channel in our single, in simple function and we end up returning it. In this case, uh, since we want to ge generate some some things, we generate uh, uh, we create generators. Sorry, we create a generator yo and a generator an. They are just waiting for some input over here, and it's the same thing. Just sending a message and sleeping some time. We end up yeah like just printing uh, these names like printing the name and just a number over here. And that's the whole function. But as simple as that, this is concurrent code. And that's pretty cool. Uh, I know it can be pretty boring to just look at some code and, and imagine the output. So let's see some example running something. A race condition is a pretty, pretty common uh, behavior when dealing with concurrency. So we can see an example over here. Let's see. I have this example already. Um, what does it do? Well, we just have our main fu uh, principal function called increment that is just like waiting, um, signaling the weight group over, over here that it's done at the end and iterating for some name. The name is just a string that we receive um, as a parameter and we have some long strings over here sending to it. We iterate each character in the, in the name and we just end up uh, incrementing some, some global integer and calling this thing that I will explain a bit later. In our main function, we create a wait group. A wait group is just simple, a function that lets us, lets us wait so for some channels or for some routines to, to terminate their job. And yeah, that's very much it. And we call this function three times with uh, some long strings over here to see if we can get some um, race condition. 
We have two ways to detect this race condition. For example, I could run this program 50 times to see if we can get some different values over here that we, we already see that we are getting those values. Or we can do some other thing. Let me show you. Um, so the expected outcome of this program was 240, uh, 248. But we see that for some cases we received the 40, 247 or 246 or something like that. And that it's a race condition over there. It means that some processes are accessing this variable and incrementing it before that they are meant to. And so we, before or not when we are, they are meant to. So we end up losing information. Um, well, this isn't relevant in this example because it's just an integer that no one cares about. Imagine that your local bank does this intercode. Um, imagine they have a lot of processes. Imagine they have a lot of clients. Imagine they do operations all day. Well, it wouldn't be funny for anyone, right? Because that would mean that somewhere, someone or a lot, of, a lot of people would be losing money, for example. And that's a real problem. Uh, so we can see that after running this program 50 times, we received some race conditions, but we also have the, pro uh, the possibility to execute programs like this. So if I remember correctly, we can run our programs with this flag and it will help us to detect ra data, uh, sorry, race conditions in our code. We can see that it's not as it's not always as easy because well this is a very short program but it can it can it can save you sometimes yeah so um the way of fits in this you can already see it right here it's by adding an atomic operation in this case we just we just are interested in uh, adding an integer of, thir of 32 bits. So in this case, uh, we just use this function and add it by one, and it shouldn't, uh, trace condition should, it ha should not happen anymore. Yeah. So we run our program using this flag, and it tells us that we don't have a race condition anymore. But if you don't believe me, we can run it. 50 times again to see if we can if we get another race condition in theory we shouldn't get an, any other if we get a race condition i i wouldn't be sure what to do here to be honest so let's wait for it to complete and it's done so yeah we see now some consistent results over here right and that's pretty good uh, but in reality, things are not going to be this easy, always. We, maybe we are dealing with race conditions uh, with maps or with more complex structs. And in that case, we should be using logs. Unfortunately, I don't have a good sample for this right now, but it, it, should, be, it should be like as simple, or, yeah, as simple as having your log, having your, uh, your critical log, section of the code and then just unlocking that part of the code yeah so well we can see that go seems pretty quick right um so i have this code at the right over here and i it would be interesting to 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 see what do you think um we saw that it's pretty quick but how fast it is in reality in this case, what I want to illustrate is that uh, this code creates a lot, a lot, a lot of a lot of uh, uh, Go functions or Go routines that are just sending a value to each other. So I want to create 100,000 Go routines that are send values like like this, and at the end, I want the last Go routine to signal the la uh, the the rightmost value that should be 100,001. The, the main question is how how fast can this be done by, by the Go compiler and the interpreter? Um, well, I think we can figure it out by running it, right? <clears throat> 
let's see uh, this is the select sample sits okay so here at the beginning of the main function uh, I have the start time that it's now and at the end I'm just I'm just printing how how much how many seconds have elapsed since all of this was done uh, it could be what do you like like a minute two minutes or so well let's check it out so for go to create 100,000 go routines and sending some value by um, by each go routine sending to the next go routine it took it less uh, a little more than than half a second that's pretty cool right what about million maybe it takes like five seconds or something like that let's see well it took less less than four seconds it's pretty cool we have a million of processes of lightweight processes running and sending values over each other and it does it it does it pretty 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 quickly so we can see that it's very reliable the speed that go offers is very reliable for your processes in case that you want to use it for your services okay so uh, coming into the end of this talk I, I'm going to talk about the select statement the select statement is kind of a, like a switch in other languages but this is made specifically for channels in Golang um, okay so here we have one in this case I have, I have a fan in model that can be exemplified by with this drawing a funding model consists of two processes coming into a funnel or a fanning and then just getting some some result at the end yeah that's pretty much it see if we can see it we have two inputs over here that are channels of strings and at the end we just want to return just one channel so we create that channel we send a go routine over here and we end up returning that channel at some point and how do we determine that point well we are looping independent independently or infinitely in inside this go routine and we are using the select statement for that the select statement has some rules that are over here all the channels are evaluated inside the uh, inside each case the selection is blocked until like uh, one communication can proceed which then does if multiple can proceed, it one will be selected pseudo-randomly, and the default close, if present, it will be executed immediately if no channel is ready. And this is not the case because we don't have a default uh, default close, and we are just it will it will be a matter of luck which uh, which value will be sent over here, and we can run this to see what will happen um this is the sample one okay so we have our process joe and our process n in this case they are uh, instantiated one after another and just sending some values over there they're sending their name and a number that a number is printed inside the uh, inside the, our simple function that we defined way, uh, way back. What happens if I run this again? Um, okay, I'm getting the same results. I was copying that at some point, yeah. So we can see that this, uh, this outcome, in this outcome, Joe comes first, it, can, it gets the zero index, but then and in, our, in another outcome, and comes first, and gets the zero index and then it just gets incrementing and yeah it happens because of the pseudo randomly selection that it's happening over here so we are never sure of what to what to expect when dealing with with these scenarios right okay so that was a, a concurrency pattern at the fan in one and for another example we can see that we can have uh, timeouts for each message 
So let's imagine that we are building an application, maybe, I don't know, a chat bar or something, and we, and we want to signal a timeout. This will be the, uh, the way to do it. We are receiving some messages over here where we want a timeout for each message. In this case, it's 800 milliseconds, and just telling it that if we don't receive a message after the time, then our services are too slow for some reason. And we can run it. We can run that as well to see what how it goes. Yeah. So we are just um, yeah. We are creating a generator called Joe that it's well running as long as it wants to, and just sending some values over to channel, and that it's returned, and over here, and it comes. It at some point it comes to this select, right? It sends some values to this uh, variable and then it prints the message. But if the message takes too long to print, it will tell us that we are too slow. Yeah. It seems that it will always happen like this. But what happens if we, want, if we want to have a timeout for all the messages? Well, we just we will just need to define the timeout before the select statement. So in this case, uh, we define a timeout before the select statement of five seconds, and then we just signal it to the to the case that we want to we want to know when those when that time has passed, and just print uh, the same message again. And we can see that sample over here. I believe it's this one, yeah. And we can run it to see how it goes. Remember that it was like five seconds, so be a bit patient with the results. Yeah. Well, we ended up printing some 11 messages or so, and then printing our, uh, our message that we need to speed things up. That's another pattern over here. And lastly, but not definitely not least, we have another example of what to do with external messages. This one is a bit more complex. Our simple function is not, not as simple anymore. We receive the same parameters. Uh, in this case, we receive another channel called quit that we are going to use a bit later. We create a channel we send a go routine that it's looping uh, infinitely again using a select statement. But in this case, using the quit channel that we defined, uh, we are receiving as a parameter, we get a signal of when to actually quit our execution. This is pretty, pretty powerful. Why? Because uh, we, will, we can be creating services that don't really need to know um, don't really need to have the content of what's calling them and just saying, hey, so I have this channel. I don't know where, where, where it will come from or what it will contain. I just know that it, at some point that channel signals me or gets a value. I need to do this. Yeah. And this case, is, well, it's another pretty simple uh, example, but we can see that we are making, we are creating this good channel over here. We are creating a generator over here. We are just run um, iterating sometimes. And when that iteration is done, we send a message over to this channel. And we don't really need to call this simple function again. We don't really need to access to this go routine by any means. We just need to signal to channel, hey, you need to quit. And yeah, um, if, can, if we look over here, we receive uh, uh, some information over here. We do some cleanup, and then we say, hey, I'm sending this string over to this uh, channel again, and I'm just returning from, from this uh, go routine. We can run this to see how it goes. It should print some information, yeah. It ended up printing two times our generator yo with some message. At the end, it just signal, hey, see you, okay, see you. Uh, I'm cleaning up, and I'm telling you that I will, I will see you again. Yeah, 
So another pattern over here, using uh, channels to to know when to think, uh, when to quit things or to end processes is very very powerful in Go, and it can be done pretty pretty easily. And that was th those were all my examples, but there were some examples at the beginning that had a sub subtle error that should really be taken care of. What was this error? Well, we can return a bit in time. And this one works. The simple function is looping infinitely. And that is that is a problem. Not in this example, of course, because well, the program gets terminated and everything goes fine. But what would happen if we were having services that run and run for years and years? Um, we will have go routines that are doing nothing, just waiting for some, I don't know, for some channel and they won't get terminated at any time. So just make sure that your go routines end up at some time and you'll be fine in the, um, when programming concurrent things. And I guess that was the last one. Yeah, that was uh, all the things that I wanted to share. Uh, just like Andrea told us, uh, if you want to go into some advanced concurrency patterns, if you want to, ta want to have a talk about that in the future, let us know in the feedback survey. We can provide any workshop related to technology that you really need to, and you can express your opinions in this survey as well. And yeah, that's pretty much it from my side. Thank you. Thank you, Van. Um, well, so as Ivan said, thank you for being here. Thank you for your time. Okay, we'll really appreciate you uh, to fill out the feedback survey. This helps us a lot. So if you can take two minutes to fill out the feedback survey and, and you can also follow us on social media, Wiseline Academy, we're posting different workshops, courses every month. So just to keep on the loop. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you, Van. Um, and thank you all the community from Vietnam for receiving us to host this awesome course. And we're gonna also upload the recording. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you very much for all of those who attended. Um, see you soon.